morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Luther Memorial Church and School. We're in the Church of Luther Confession, CLC. As we wind down and get closer and closer to the celebration of our Savior's birth, we rejoice again today as we look at the various comments that are made among ourselves and around our society. As we look at this mission theme in general, I asked, remember last Sunday, everyone tried to invite someone to the Christmas services throughout this past week. How'd you do? Did you get a chance to invite one person? I know it was a struggle for me at times, and I want to tell you why I think it's a struggle for each one of us in the service today. So let's begin our worship service today with prayer. O Lord God, we come together to hear your holy word. That through the hearing of your word, we may be brought to repent of all of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in your grace and holiness. Hear us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We begin our worship service today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing verses 1, 5, and 6 of our opening hymn. us from all unrighteousness. 
Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. But we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Renew us by your Spirit and lead us in the way everlasting. Jesus Christ is the satisfactory payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You are forgiven. With boldness and confidence we may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of Jesus Christ's forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Amen. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, hear our prayers. By your mercy, bring light to our darkened hearts. For you who live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit are one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our two scripture lessons for today, there's two questions that are similar that focus on our service theme. Questions that we ask about coming to God's house, about joining together to worship. In our first scripture lesson from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 56, we see there from verses 1 through 8. Isaiah basically asking the question, why do you come to God's house? Isaiah beautifully relays the word of the Lord to his people about keeping the Sabbath day. Without looking, you remember what commandment that is? It's the third commandment. What will the Lord give to all those, including foreigners of all nations and Gentiles alike, who come to his house? He gives his faithful message as a covenant, which is a promise of salvation to all people, and a call, as he does for us today, to remain faithful to him. This prophecy is seen fulfilled in Acts 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, who is baptized by Philip after hearing the word of God. Isaiah 56, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a better, a name better than that of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, and holds fast my covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, Yet I will gather to him others, besides those who are gathered to him. As we were looking forward to this Sunday, that's why I asked you last week to gather other people into God's house. The Lord uses you and your mouth to invite people to hear what Christmas is all about. Do you know anyone who has forgotten it? Who has lost their focus of it? These are the important questions we ask ourselves again today. As we look at our second scripture lesson, it's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 18 through 26. Jesus asked the crowd, Why did you come, what did you come out to see? He asked us three times in connection with John the Baptist's ministry. And there was potential for the crowd to dismiss John's teaching because of the unexpected aspects of his ministry. In other words, living in the wilderness, wearing lowly clothing, and speaking with conviction against the religious leaders. Jesus realigned their expectations by directing them back to Scripture. 
Likewise, Jesus answered John's own question about whether or not he was the Messiah in the same way. Jesus pointed John back to Scripture to see the fulfillments that were happening through his miracles. Each time we come before the Word of God, it is proper to ask the same. What did I come to see or hear? Are your expectations of Jesus in agreement with God's Word? Beginning with verse 18. Then the disciples, the followers of John, reported to him concerning all these things. John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? In that very hour, he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go, and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, that the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, they say to you, and more than a prophet. That verse 23 there. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That's what we're focusing on today in the devotion, the meditation. And so as we rejoice that we continue to confess our faith in the Lord, let us rise boldly to make that confession of our faith. In the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day he will raise me and all the dead, and give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. Continue with our hymn of the day. Please be seated.
congregation who would like to come forward, please come forward at this time. good to see you all in the Lord's house today. We're able to rejoice again that we are a part of God's family because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Maddie, would you hand me that case right there? Pass it, pass it over here, please. Oh, thank you very much. Anybody have an idea or guess what this probably is? Yeah. It is a case. Do you know what's inside the case? What's that? Something is in the case. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to call on you anymore today. <laughs> what is this? Yes. A trumpet. This is my trumpet. Yep. I got this in California from a, a trumpet student for like $80, which is a really good price. He's a little bit older than you. And guess what? He never played it, so he just wanted to get rid of it. And guess what? I don't really play it that much either. In fact, if you look closely, probably shouldn't have it on my black gown <laughs> lap here. There's a ton of dust on this. Why do you think there's so much dust on this? Sid? I don't use it very much. I don't like practicing. In fact, every time I think I should probably practice, I like to make excuses not to practice. What do you think some of those excuses might be? Any of you play instruments or have other things we like to make excuses about? Kayla? Well, I've already played it. I know how to play it already. I don't need to practice. Jack? Yeah, I already know how to play. I'm too lazy. Yep, you're right. Too lazy to practice. We make excuses. Oh, maybe we say, I've got more important things to do to practice. I've got other things that I would rather do than practice. So laziness, yeah, whatever it might be. We are very good at making excuses. What kind of excuses do you make? If you, maybe you are trying to play instruments, maybe you make excuses to not <coughs> practice your instruments either, or to not play. Do you make excuses for anything else, boys? What about making your bed or brushing your teeth? I think I heard some excuses last night with my own kids. Oh, I'm too tired to brush my teeth. Is that an excuse? What other excuses can we make? You know what? As you get older, the excuses get a lot easier to make, whether they be about work. I don't want to go to work. I'm too tired to go to work. Other excuses maybe we've heard. Homework. You ever make excuses not to do homework? What would you rather do than homework? Watch TV. Right? Play games. Play go outside, play video games. Basically anything would be better than doing homework, right? We all make lots of excuses. Maybe even this Christmas time, we were making excuses. Ah, got to go over to that family member's house or maybe we're not too excited about. Or maybe there's all kinds of different things that we don't necessarily want to do. And that's true of where we are right now, especially as we get older. A few weeks ago, we talked about making excuses by saying, I'm so busy. I'm too busy to practice. I'm too busy to come to God's house. I'm too busy or I have too many things to do or I don't want to because I'm lazy or I'm scared to invite people to our Christmas Eve service or Christmas Day service or any service where we hear God's word and God's love for us. Are you like me and we make excuses to not share God's word? Yeah, because it's a lot like practicing an instrument. The more we spend time in God's word, what do you think will happen? The more time we spend playing an instrument, what do you think will happen? Ellie? The more we spend time practicing trumpet or piano or any instrument, what's going to happen if we practice more? Yeah, so the more time we spend with God and His Word, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, our 
faith will grow, we'll know more about God, our relationship will be stronger, he'll give us good advice, good wisdom, he'll remind us of all the things he's forgiven us, laziness, all those things he's forgiven us, weakness to not share his name with others because we make excuses. Once you listen carefully to the meditation today, the, the sermon, because I'm going to talk about a couple different people from the Bible. One that you probably remember who made all, all kinds of excuses. And so we want to learn from that. So that we don't find ourselves making excuses all the time to spend time with Jesus or spend time doing anything else because we are pretty, pretty lazy by nature. There's lots of things that if we don't want to do it, we're not going to do it. So we need to pray again this morning that the Lord would bless us as we come to his house to teach and remind us and help us to learn and grow so that we won't make excuses, but we go and do the work that he wants us to do out of our love and thankfulness for his love and his gift to us. And what is the best gift that Jesus has given us? Since we're getting close to Christmas time with gifts. Jack? He died on the cross for us. Came to this world, died on the cross for our sins. Very good. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Help to expose our excuses again today so that we can see clearly how we've sinned against you. And help encourage us by your forgiveness and love and faithfulness to us as we go to faithfully try to share your word with others. Help us to be excited and joyful in this opportunity. We pray in your saving name. Amen. Dear Pilgrim Partners, every word of God is pure, and all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable to each one of us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped, rightly and correctly dividing God's word of truth, understanding that truth. As you look at our message for today, we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and our theme and our phrase that, as we're looking at these phrases that we often think in here, is that quote, that theme, I just don't want to offend anyone. Maybe you've caught yourself thinking that. Maybe even saying that to someone. When it comes to speaking up for God's truth, or inviting someone, or even saying, Merry Christmas. I just don't want to offend anyone, Pastor. I just don't want to offend anyone. Well, that is good. But as we've learned the last few weeks, there is a right and a wrong kind of pretty much everything. And there's a, a wrong kind of offense. There's a wrong kind of offending people. And there's a right kind, too. Really? A right way to offend people? Yes. And so as we look through the word of God today in Paul's letter to the young pastor in 2 Timothy 2, we begin with verse 8. Follow along with me, please, on the bottom of page 4. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. The word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. This is the word of God for our meditation and edification this morning, so we pray. Lord Jesus, as we approach your Christmas celebration, the birth of you coming to this world, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I 
I'm guessing this past week, if you took to heart what I asked you to do as your little mini assignment, not from me, but truly from Jesus and his great commission to go and share his word, go invite others to hear his word, you probably ran into what I ran into. I was thinking, you know, I'm the pastor. I better come back with a good report of all the people I talked to, all the people I invited to Christmas Eve. I could maybe think of three to four or five that I actually physically asked Hey, why don't you come to our Christmas Eve service? I was scared. I was nervous. I was worried about offending people. Am I just like you? I hope not. I hope you have more courage than I do. I hope you have more strength. I hope you're motivated by the right reasons to bring the word of God to someone. Not because my pastor told me to. Because that's our joy as being Christ's messengers. There is a wrong kind of offending people. We see that in our study today, motivated by our fear and our faithlessness. That's the opposite of being faithful, isn't it? Our faithlessness of doing what God would like us to do, what God expects us to do as his life, as his people. If you were to read the context, if you have your Bibles with you today, you go back to the first part of 2 Timothy 2. Listen there to verses 1 through 3. Paul says to Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Be strong. Endure. Be faithful. All those things are not offensive to the Lord. In fact, we would rejoice in each one of those things. We would never glorify our weakness. We would never glorify our faithlessness. Can you imagine that? A spouse doing that? Yeah, I was, I was really unfaithful to my wife the other day. Yet the Lord reminds us to be strong in the word of God as he points to us what he views as offensive behavior. Timothy is reminded of three illustrations. The first one we heard just a second ago from 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. As a faithful soldier... What does that mean? What is probably the worst thing a soldier can have? Fear. Isn't it? Fear to charge ahead in the battle. Fear to follow the captain's command. Faithlessness. And following those commands as they're told. But yet we're reminded as we go on in those verses, 4 through 6, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who listed him as a soldier. You are a soldier for Christ. You are the ones he has called to be faithful with his word, to share that word of God with others. And like me, we all have been very faithless at times, unfaithful in carrying out the Lord's plan. But the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, is not done with his illustrations. And I get excited about that because I love illustrations. Verse 5 says, And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The Lord talks about how, as we Christians, we want to continue to grow stronger in our faith and that we want to follow the rule book. Because faithful, faithlessness to the rules, faithfulness to the Lord's command is not going to benefit us or our team. Let me put that in perspective for a second. We all at times have maybe had concerns about our congregation getting smaller and smaller and taking care of what the Lord's given us. How do you think the Lord would want us to continue to be faithful to Him? Does it involve us as good soldiers, as athletes, enduring life to go out and share that Word of God? To invite them to God's house to hear the precious and pure truths of God's holy word. That's part of our responsibility as God's people to be faithful to him. Truly what offensive behaviors are, as we see with Timothy's third illustration, the hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. 
I love that illustration. We know, and living in the farmlands of eastern Wisconsin, how hard farmers have to work. They're up early. They stay up late. They're working <laughs> over and over again. And of course, they're going to benefit from that work before anyone else does. As a Christian, as a soldier, as an athlete for the Lord, training and working hard is part of our responsibility. So as the children said a moment ago, that we grow stronger in our faith, not to make excuses. Can you imagine a farmer saying, you know what, I just, I don't want to go plant those crops. I don't want to go till the field. I don't want to do the harvest this year. How would that turn out for them? Or the athlete that says, I don't want to train, much like the musician who doesn't want to practice. How is that going to go? Or the soldier that says, I'm not going to go into battle. I'm too afraid. I mentioned to the kids a moment ago about what offensive behavior looks like, and all these find excuses, don't they? And who better to look at than, in my opinion, the king of all excuses of the Bible? Moses. If you were to go back to Exodus 3 and 4, when God, through that amazing burning bush, calls Moses, when he's standing on holy ground, he calls Moses from that burning bush, and you would think that as the Lord's telling him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob, I have called you for a purpose. We'd be thinking, oh, this is awesome, I'm so excited. And as soon as he finds out what his purpose is, Moses starts with the excuses. What's my purpose, Lord? What do, you, what, do you, what do you have me do? I want you to go back to Egypt. You know where you murdered that guy? You know that you're wanted? I want you to go back to Egypt. You know where the, all those millions of people, your, your fellow Hebrews, are enslaved to the powerful, world power Egyptians? I want you to go back there and tell Pharaoh to let them go. Excuse me? What? Who am I to do that, Lord? That was Moses' first excuse. I'm not qualified to go, Lord. Are you kidding me? <laughs> what does the Lord say to Moses? Because the Lord, for each one of us today, is in the habit of eliminating our excuses. That's what he's doing for you and for me today. He's eliminating our excuses to not go this week, to invite people to God's house, to speak God's word faithfully, to stand up for truth, are you kidding me, Pastor? You want me to go and talk about my faith? What if I offend someone? Moses wasn't worried about offending Pharaoh. He was worried about being put to death. And what does the Lord say to eliminate that excuse? He says, I will be with you, just as I was with your fathers. When I was in college, I never thought I was ever going to become a pastor. I never thought I should do this. I should never stand. I was terrified. I was fearful of standing in front of people. You can ask my wife about our college public speaking course. <clears throat> terrified. And yet the Lord eliminates excuses because he reminded me the more I spend time in God's word, I will be with you. I'm going to go with you. You don't have anything to fear. If you're fearful, read what I've done for those who have gone before you. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And that's why we're spending time with his word today. So that we are encouraged, that we are excited to go as he qualifies us again today to stop the excuses. Do you think that would be enough? The Lord God speaking to Moses and saying, I'm going to be with you. Yet Moses comes back with yet another excuse in Exodus 3 and 4. The Lord, what if what if they ask me what your name is? I don't know. I'm not learned enough. I, I, haven't, I haven't been taught enough, Lord. The Lord responds, tell them I am that I am who has sent me. The God of yesterday, today, and forever. That's the God who has sent you. We know basics of our faith. We can tell someone about Jesus. It's not hard to mention who our Savior is. Very simple, the, the children did this morning. Very well. Jesus died for our sins. Best Christmas gift ever. They would come into the world. 
And yet we are so afraid to do that. We make excuses. Even though that the Lord has said, I will teach you everything you need to know. I will be with you in the moment of you sharing your faith and you telling Pharaoh, Moses, I'll be with you. I'll tell you what to say. I'll give you the words. And yet Moses comes up with a third excuse. Lord, I don't think it's going to work. I guarantee if you tried to share your faith with someone this week or invite someone, you probably thought that at one point in time. Because every time I tried to, it was in the back of my mind. They're not going to come. They don't care what I have to say. It's not going to work. We are just like Moses, aren't we? And yet when the Lord says, no, I'm going to give you signs along with this. Remember Moses was able to lay his staff, turn into a snake, put his hand into his coat pocket, came out leprous. He gave him signs and wonders. In fact, he said, I'm going to turn the Nile into blood so that they know that I sent you. Jesus says in his ministry that we will do greater signs than what he had done. I don't see any of you raising the dead and doing miracles, but there's truth to this point. Because the Holy Spirit works simply through our words and not signs. Think about that for a second. People come to faith by your message and not by your signs. Is that not greater than having people believe through signs? And yet the Lord would choose each one of you to do this powerful work. And yet we're like Moses. I'm not qualified. I'm not learned enough. Lord, I, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think people are going to listen to me today, Lord. I, I can't do it anymore. i got to be done. Where do you think that fear comes from? Where do you think that we find that faithlessness from? It's not from the Lord. Because he encourages us over and over again. Moses went on to make another excuse. Lord, speaking is not my gift. If you talk to anyone that I was in high school and college with, actually, one of you might today say, you're not that great of a speaker all the time. <laughs> Making a lot of mistakes. You're going to make mistakes sharing God's word. You're going to chip over your words. I've done it many times. Does that give you excuse to not share the words? God gave the answer to Moses again. Who made man's tongue? Who made his mouth? I will give you the words. I will open your mouth. I will cause you to speak. One of my favorite things about the ministry is going into a situation where I was terrified. Where I thought, which is many Sundays, by the way, speaking in front of all of you. And then realizing after all is done, the Lord gave me courage that was never there. Getting a phone call, so-and-so is dying, come right now. What am I going to say? In the world around us, people are dying in their sin. What are you going to say? As the Lord calls you to go. We are on the same plane here. We all have the same calling, just like Moses did. To go. This is our purpose. And yet, as the Lord answers every one of our excuses, do you know what Moses finally said? That angered God? That God got God, God so wrathful and angry he was about to kill Moses? Moses said, send someone else, Lord. I can't do it. God had eliminated every excuse from Moses. And he finally had the gall and nerve to say to God, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go. Send someone else in my place. And so you see, Moses is, was motivated. He didn't want to offend people. He didn't want to and he was truly offending the Lord because he was motivated by his fear and his faithlessness to God. The Lord answers all those things. And the Lord was offended because the Lord had qualified Moses to go and said he would be with him, just like he does for you. So, in our theme, I don't want to offend anyone. How does that make sense? It is good because who we should not want to offend is the Lord who has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light to proclaim the praises of him who loved you and was willing to do this for you. We talked about Moses. I want to talk about, very briefly, 
the flip side to Moses. Because there is a right kind of offense with excitement like Isaiah. Now, if you're going to go back to Isaiah in chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, Isaiah was called just like Moses, not in the same way with the burning bush. In fact, it was less dramatic than that. And he was asked to go to the people and tell them to repent because they were worshiping other gods. They were not honoring the Sabbath. Basically doing things that we all do from time to time. Isaiah was called to go and he said to the Lord, Woe is me, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Sounds like a pretty good excuse. Lord, I'm a sinner. I should not be doing this. Sounds just like Moses. I have unclean lips. I can't speak, Lord. I can't do this. Then one of the angels flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he'd taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity, your sin is taken away, and your sin is purged. And the Lord, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go? Remember what Isaiah said? Hear my Lord. Send me. What great excitement. You see the total contrast between Moses and Isaiah? Moses recognized that he was incapable of doing this, and yet he said, Here I am. Send me, Lord. Choose me. I'll go for you. You've taken away my sin. I will go. I would much rather be like Isaiah with that attitude when it comes to going out sharing that word of God, opening our mouth to declare what Christmas is about, the joy and peace that we have in our Savior. The Lord asks each one of us today, truly, throughout this week, if the Lord came on Christmas Day, that was the end of the world, He asks you, will you go? In our hearts, I pray that each one of us raise our hands and says, Here I am, Lord. Send me. I know people, Lord, that need to be reminded about what Christmas is about. I know people who need to be reminded that their sins are forgiven. I know people who need to be brought back into your fold. Send me! What a joy to have that kind of excitement. It's only going to come through the Holy Spirit. It's only going to come through the hearing of God's Word. It's not going to come on your own. And I know for certain each one of you in your life, whether it's a close family member or friend, has someone that needs to be steered in the right direction to eternal life and away from the devil and the hell. What will you say? Will you shy away and say, that's not what I'm here to do? That's not my gifts? I don't know enough? Or will you stand up and say, Lord, here I am. I will speak your word in love. I will speak your word and truth because I love you I'm not afraid to admit it that is what we see through Isaiah motivated by the Lord's faithfulness you know what's really cool as you look at that last part of that section from our sermon text today it was believed to be an early hymn of the Christian church we can only imagine what it sounded like verses 11, 12, and 13 there's four conditional classes if this happens, then this is going to happen. Like, we know if it snows, there's going to be snow on the sidewalk. If it rains, the sidewalk's going to be wet. Look at these four absolute truths. If we died with Christ, believing in Christ, then we will live with Him. What does Jesus say? Because I live, you will live also. Sweet! Let's go share that good news. Look at the second one. If we endure... We shall also reign with him. Endure what? The offending of other people. As we say Merry Christmas. As we share what Christmas is all about. It will offend people. Just like Jesus' message offended people. If we deny him, he will also deny us. The scary thought. Can you imagine standing before the throne in heaven? And Jesus says, I never knew you. You never shared my name with anyone. You live to serve yourself and not me. Guilty. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory of that forgiveness and that love. As we endure this life, 
we know we will spend eternal life with him because of that forgiveness. If we are faithless, if we are sinful, look what he says there. He remains faithful to us. What a blessing. And the last phrase there isn't even a conditional clause. It's not an if-then thing at all. He cannot deny himself. He does not lie. If he tells you he loves you, if he tells you you're forgiven, if he tells you you're going to spend a promise and eternal life in heaven, done. He can't lie. He can't deny himself. He is truth. And he is the way for us. What a blessing it is today as we rejoice in Jesus' faithfulness to us and that each one of us should be concerned about offending someone, our Lord and Savior. As we continue to rejoice in the opportunities to share our faith and our love for him, let us rather be more concerned about offending God than our fellow people around us by not speaking about our love for him, by not inviting them to hear the joys out of the lips of the children about what our Lord and Savior has done for each one of us. What a blessing it is. And may we pray for strength from the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to worry about thinking, oh, I'm so worried about offending people. Let's continue to rejoice in that what our Savior has done for us always and forever. The Lord be with you as you go out and share this precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's rise and sing hymn 496.
sister to the Godofsky family, to Barb Godofsky. Uh, she had a lymph node surgery, and it was a pretty intense surgery, and it was challenging at times, but the Lord has got her through that, and has continued her on the path of recovery, which we give thanks for. So with this prayer for this morning, and our continued Christmas prayers of blessing from the Holy Spirit, we give thanks and we pray. O oh Lord God, the Shepherd of Israel. We offer you our thanks and praise for leading your chosen people of Old Testament times through all the long years of promise, and even using men like Moses, who at first not wanting to go, to be wonderful shepherds, and praying for those whom they continue to try to serve, and then also fulfilling your word by bringing your only Son into the world as a lamb, as a sacrifice for us sinners as well. Grant to us such a strong and sturdy faith in your promises that we may rejoice and give thanks forevermore. Forgive our sins also, and remove all of our doubts and iniquities. In your great mercy, open our blind eyes and guide our uncertain steps in the paths of righteousness as we lead others who look to us as what Christian means. So we ask that you would cleanse us of impure thoughts, words, and deeds. When we are slow to listen to your word or to share that word, open our ears to the truth. Grant us by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may, will greet you with joy on that day when our Lord will come again to bring light to the hidden things of darkness and to reveal the hearts of all people. Rule in the hearts of everyone here this morning, dear Lord, and guide the decisions of those in authority so that peace and justice may prevail in our land and in our congregation and homes. 
Grant that all may learn that only those things which are in harmony with your word are truly good and true and enduring. Bless all who are gathered here before you this day in the fellowship of the Spirit, especially those here in your house. For those who couldn't make it, we ask you to continue to pour out your blessing upon them. We give them every opportunity to read and study and grow in your holy word. Be also with those who are sick or under any affliction of body, mind, or spirit. We pray for Amy this morning, that you continue to heal her from her surgery and bring her a speedy recovery. That she continue on those daily tasks that she does and that they may be done for your glory. Comfort them and each one of us that we all may, through our trials, learn of your gracious power and readiness to help in every time of need. All these things, dear Lord, whatever else you see that we need, we ask in the name of our great Lord and Savior, in whose name we also rise to pray the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his countenance and his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Include with the final hymn, hymn 352, verses 1 and 4. You may remain standing. Christmas caroling, uh, so if you'd like to meet at the, the Woodlands, we're going to be meeting there at 3, we'll probably go to about 5.30. Their schedules look like these, they're on the back pew in the entryway, so go ahead and grab one of those. There's also an email that I sent out yesterday, so uh, and afterwards the Cybels have invited everybody over graciously to their, their home for some supper, so 
Uh, whether you want to meet here and carpool out, you know, at like 245 or something like that, or if you want to meet out there so you have the freedom to drive and go as you need to, um, we'd really like to have you come. So we continue to share that cheer and that Christmas message with others. There will be a, a women's choir practice in the back immediately after church for the Christmas Eve service. And this is the last Sunday for the collection for the ILC professors and the called workers. Those boxes are in the back by the Kleenex box. Um, there are still items also for the school and church wish list tree in the hallway. And uh, the tree will be up for just another week or so. But then the box for donations is back there also. Um, there's a sign up for serving and cleaning up after our fellowship hour on the first of every month. There's plenty of things to sign up for there. The hope is that families would take turns helping out each month. So please sign up in the entryway. You know, Milwaukee does an interesting thing where all the families who are members are just kind of responsible for one of the 12 months. So like three families are kind of grouped together. And if we don't get anybody signing up, we'll probably eventually have to do that because we just we need people to help serve in this, these ways. Um, there's also the sign up for Christmas Eve pre-service pre-service music. If you're interested in playing for the pre-service for Christmas Eve, the sign-ups for that also. Uh, if you want to play an instrument or instrumentalist or any hymns, um, you can speak to me if you have any questions on that. Uh, Saturday, noon Christmas uh, practice for the children, noon or 10 to noon uh, for this coming Saturday. And then next Sunday, there's some questions about this. We are having Christmas Eve morning service at 10. There'll be Christmas practice and Bible class that morning. And then we'll have our Christmas Eve service at 10 and our uh, Christmas Day service at 10 on Monday morning. The following weekend, it's important, I have some of it in the schedule here. Um, Christmas or New Year's Eve morning, there will be service, but we're not going to do Bible class or Sunday school, which we normally don't do that. I'll make sure I confirm that with the council this week. But that'll be uh, New Year's Eve Sunday morning, just the 10 o'clock service. And then there's no New Year's Day service this year, according to what the council had decided. Uh, just as a heads up to that. The last thing I want to bring your attention to, uh, it was due last week, but the council is trying to anticipate for our budget ideas of next year. There was uh, in your mailboxes several weeks ago, and I've sent it through email a couple times, and there's still forms in the back. Uh, you've noticed the last couple Sundays I've put uh, Christian Giving, a, a study that uh, Mike Schoenbeck and I revised from uh, some other pastors I've put together. Um, so there's, those studies are in the bottom left corner of the mailbox. All we're asking is that you would anonymously kind of project for us what you're thinking about giving in offerings for the year next year. You know, and the, the idea of the study is to kind of reflect on that. And then uh, that helps us to try to budget for the future as well. So it's not something we've done in the past, but we're hoping it would help for the future for us to kind of know where we can manage things. So please take the five, ten minutes that would probably take you to do to do that. It'll benefit our work greatly in our congregation as well. Any other announcements that I'm forgetting for this morning? Yes? 4th or 8th grader practicing chimes in the fellowship hall. Any other announcements? So Lord gives us another chance this week to share God's word and to invite others. And I will be praying for my own strength and for your strength as well as we go to do that. Rather than making excuses like I'm good at doing. So Lord be with you as we continue to share that love of Christ.